your seasons over and say, this is what I want to see us do next season. These are the general things we're gonna do going about it. The micro cycles and the micro goals are the smaller bits of it. And so, uh, back to the block periodization, if I'm, my, each one of these blocks is a micro cycle. It's, it's an idea of a shorter term type thing that's gonna get me closer to that macro goal, where the entire, all three of those in a row would be the macro. Does that make sense? I hope I'm not being redundant. I just really have no idea where you guys are at with <laughs> what, I, yeah. Let me know if you guys, oh, we don't know all this stuff, and you're just talking to talk, but that's not my intention. Um, we talked about uh, overtraining. S uh, another, another thought on that is the idea of deloading um, and overreaching. So overtraining is something that people are still debating whether or not it really exists. Some people say, well, there's no such thing as overtraining. There's just under-eating and under-resting. Like, that's, okay, well, you're overtrained. You're, you're training too much, and you're not recovering adequately to be able to continue to improve and do the things you want. Um, some signs of that, you're gonna show up uh, if you're training client, if you're training guys, and they're just beat down. You don't wanna keep pushing them crazy, crazy, crazy hard because their body is having a negative response to it. That's if, the way to test for that, too, is to examine the other parts of their life, at least in my experience. If someone is eating really well, they're in a, they're in a caloric surplus of, of generally clean, healthy foods, they are getting adequate rest, they are telling you that they're doing all their extra mobility work, the things that you do outside of your training that really impact it, there should never really be a reason to overtrain unless you're pushing them so hard with some poor programming like maxing every day or just constantly being stuck in the state of testing. And so by kind of waiving your intensities and playing around with the volumes and the frequencies and all of that stuff, you have a better opportunity to prevent that, delay it, and possibly even eliminate it. The idea of a deload is when someone's already hitting that point and they just need some time off. Um, that can, that can come up in any training session. It can be for a week, it can be for a little while. Some people like to finish a competitive season of something and then rest for a month. I'm, uh, there's some competitive bodybuilders that do that. They'll train really, really hard and they'll diet down for a, for a show and they'll get really, really, really lean, borderline unhealthy, completely unhealthy, and get to that show. And they're like, I don't even wanna see a weight for another month, I wanna go and I wanna eat cheeseburgers and cheesecake and other things that I can put cheese in because cheese is delicious. <laughs> and that's, I've been restricting myself so much and I've been pushing it so hard and destroying my body, I need a rest from that. And so you might see some people who need that much time off. Um, personally, if I'm training and I get into a session, I don't like the plan deloads myself. Um, a few of these programs that I've listed down below have set deloads where after this many weeks, you need to deload because they're anticipating that you're gonna be burnt out and your central nervous system's gonna be taxed, your muscles and ligaments are gonna be tired and sore, and you're gonna need some time off. I am much more of the camp that your body will know better than any training program will, and so when it's developing your own training, if I don't feel like lifting, and it's not just because I feel lazy today, if I feel like I've been doing my other stuff right, and something's not going, I should probably walk away or take it easy for a little while and let myself recover. And it's sometimes more difficult and takes more discipline and restraint to be able to do that. It's even tougher when you're a coach and you're training someone and you can't tell if they're legitimately overtrained or if they're just kind of punking out on you. And so you always have to keep that in mind. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why some of these programs have built-in deloads. Because I don't ever want to be the guy that's responsible for giving a program out to people and having them come back and just kill themselves and say, well, you never told me when to take a break. So a lot of these kind of preset things give you a general guideline of, it's been, it's been three to 12 weeks. You should probably take it easy for a week or something. And they'll have that written. That is in my opinion, a safety mechanism to kind of cover their own butts and make sure that they're not responsible for anybody really injuring themselves. <laughs> um, the idea of overreaching is when you, it's almost intentional overtraining. It's when I'm gonna push an athlete for a specific amount of time past 
the level of comfort where they're getting pretty darn close to overtraining, and then I'm immediately gonna follow that up with some deloading. There's a couple of programs here at the bottom that are lift-specific um, that I included. Those are generally examples of overreaching programs where you're going to try to spike a short period of time with extreme intensity and extreme growth. These are the kind of programs that have a tendency to up the volume, intensity, and frequency all at the same time, and they're not maintainable for a long period of time because of that. And so it's, it's a different level when you have something like the list specific programs where you said, man, I've got 12 weeks and I really want to squat more. I'm going to run a small off or a small off junior squat program. Those things are brutal because they have you doing the same lift three to four days a week. They have you working with insanely high percentages that increase assuming your lifts are going to go up. They don't give you any breaks and the intensity is just crazy. And so in those kind of situations, you're gonna know that your athlete's gonna be burnt out at the end of it, not able to give you a lot more, and you can't stack those kind of programs together. And so you just always have to keep that in mind when you're programming for someone. Is this gonna be a long-term sustainable thing? Am I gonna have them go through and we're gonna work on this you know, block periodization, work them up to this level, bring them back down, and kind of wave through that? Or am I gonna try to really just keep them consistently growing for a long period of time at a slower rate. But that's, that's kind of the considerations you need to make when you're designing a program for someone. Um, I included a couple, like I've been mentioning, a couple of popular strength training templates. A lot of these are really popular in the powerlifting community. Um, I would make the argument that powerlifting is the best gauge for absolute strength development. Um, Olympic lifting is great, but a lot of it comes down to technical things and you never see any of them break form. And so most of the time they're not having to push their body um, to their utmost strength potential because I can't catch a clean that's as heavy as I can deadlift. It doesn't matter how high I pull it, it's just you have to, they have those kind of things um, to consider. And with, uh, with strongman there's a lot of technicalities and, and movement involved and things that are so hard to train specific, it's really hard to test anything that's there. I think generally all strength training programs, unless someone's injured, should really kind of fall back on the basic core lifts, usually the power lifts with other kind of uh, branches off of those, um, unless you have an athlete or an individual you're training that can't complete those lifts safely or effectively because of an injury or some sort of uh, physical ailment. Um, but it's just, those are the, the reason those are the competitive lifts in powerlifting is because they're the easiest ones to measure and track and they're a really good gauge of maximal strength development in the upper, the lower, and the full body. And that's why those are the lifts that are picked. And so most of these programs are generally powerlifting based the thing about it, when you're designing a program for someone, you, you you don't, if someone comes to you and they want a program or you're training athletes, don't just take a program that's already made and say, man, there you go, leave me alone, I don't want to think anymore. That's, that's not going to be your job. Your job is to do at least some individual assessment because as a coach or a strength uh, as someone, as someone who's trying to help others get to that level, your success is defined by their success. It doesn't matter how smart and knowledgeable you are. If your athletes aren't doing well and improving, you're not a very good coach. That's just, that's just the real measure of it. And so you never want to put their success in the hands of someone that doesn't have any kind of personal experience with them. If you're working with athletes, you need to make sure that you're making appropriate adjustments for them. And so that's my disclaimer for, even though I'm giving you guys this list of programs that are all, at least in some, in some camp, considered the most effective at whatever they do, you can't just blanket statement, give that to anybody. Um, and just kind of go through with some of the different ideas behind them. Starting strength is something that Mark, it's a book Mark Ripto wrote uh, years and years ago. It's kind of, well, it's, I mean, starting strength. It's a very basic template. It has a lot of uh, three sets of five doing the squat, the bench press, and the deadlift multiple times in the week. Um, intensity is generally pretty low. Volume is moderate. 
and your frequency is high enough that you're learning the lifts and you're getting through that. And so that's kind of how that one's um, turned out. That That is designed to get someone who is not used to training competitive lifts to a level where they can at least do them in a safe and repeatable fashion. Uh, mad cow is not considered the disease in this instance. It's um, a lot of guys talk about five by five training, five sets of five of whatever the lift is, whether it's a squat, a bench press, a deadlift, a row, a pull, not generally not a pull up, some sort of thing where it's five, five sets of five, that's gonna be 25 lifts for whatever that core lift is for the session. I would say generally 25 lifts is a moderate amount of volume for anybody who is getting to an intermediate level of strength. Um, a good a good kind of gauge of the amount of lifts that someone should be performing uh, at various levels is called Prelefin's chart. I didn't write it on here. If you guys want to write it down, um, Shane probably has talked about it or will be talking about it, I'm assuming. Uh, Prelefin was um, a trainer who took the time to write down what the optimal kinds of, um, what the optimal ranges of lifts were for an athlete, depending on what it was. And uh, they have basically recommendations for how many lifts you should be performing at whatever percentage of the max it is to make it an optimal amount. So if you're training at 90% um, or above, you should probably keep it to one to three lifts of that kind of an effort per workout because any more you're gonna be pushing that intensity a little too high. Uh, a lot of Eastern Bloc, um, Eastern Bloc uh, lifters, the Russians and the Ukrainians and all those really strong guys who speak uh, different languages, they do a lot of um, training between like 70 to 85% as a norm. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the range that they tend to work with and they have a lot more frequency and a lot more volume because they're professionally employed at doing that and all they have to worry about doing is going to the gym and lifting four times a day or something and so they have to keep their intensity low enough that they can repeat that but they have nothing else to worry about so their frequency and their volume can be higher. Um, fat PHAT is a power building program uh, by Dr. Lane Norton. He developed that. Um, he's a competitive drug tested bodybuilder and power lifter and he's done pretty well in both of those um, sports and a lot of people who don't want to commit to just strength, they want to keep some hypertrophy work in there, uh, will go with something like a PHAT. Um, and I'm not as familiar with that style of training because it uh, hasn't, at least to this point, fit my set, of, my set of goals, but it's pretty easy to research and I believe most of um, the things on that are free on the internet if you just search uh, Fat Lane Norton with PH, not F. You might get some mean photoshops or something. Uh, I mentioned Westside Barbell. They, for a very long time, were pretty dominant in the um, American powerlifting field. Uh, I, I still tell people when they ask me what I think about Westside, um, I think it's an effective training program uh, for higher, intermediate to higher level lifters because they utilize a lot of exercise rotation. You don't get as much practice at the lifts themselves and so the specificity is really low. Um, they do have a moderate, the frequency you're doing the lifts usually twice a week. Um, as far as some sort of lift, but it's not the competitive movement itself. And so uh, I might squat for three weeks and then for the next three weeks, I might train a good morning as my primary max effort movement, which a good morning is going to have some carryover to the squat, but it's not a squat. And so I'm not gonna get better technically at squatting by doing some exercise that tends to work the same muscles because the motor pattern's different the stress that it's putting on your system is gonna be different and it's going to have enough variation that you're not gonna get enough practice that I wouldn't recommend it for someone who's an uh, intro level lifter, um, even an intermediate level lifter. If you are pretty darn perfect at it, you can vary a little bit more because you can expect that to happen. I'd also caution anybody, unless you're using uh, weightlifting equipment because they do a lot of box squatting, a lot of really tough stuff on the hips that has a tendency to cause overtraining in non-enhanced and non Gear lifters. Uh, 531 is, um, I'll be honest, most of, the, most of the clients that I train 
Uh, my first thought when they come to me and say I want to get better at squat, bench, and deadlift is, well, I only get to see you once or twice a week. I'm gonna, I'm thinking five, three, one in the back of my mind already until you give me a reason not to. And the idea of five, three, one is it's one of those programs that is a long haul. I'm gonna commit to doing this for six to twelve months to improve on these lifts. Um, it's set up. It's pretty low volume generally. It's it's you're lifting. You're training each of the main lifts once a week. Um, the volume is generally pretty low. You're gonna work only really three big work sets per workout and everything else is kind of free to play with and you can throw in um, different weakness assessments. It's really, really, really easy to manipulate this program to fit someone's specific goals. Um, but the five, the three, and the one uh, represent the kinds of rep ranges that you're working in depending on where you're at. So the first week is going to be um, a set of five. It's all percentage based, so you, you assume uh, training max for the individual. You say this is going to be um, what your what your max squat, what your max bench press, what your max deadlift, and what your max overhead press are. And then I'm going to take like 10 percent, and I'm going to take that off that, and we're going to set all your percentages on that training max because I don't want it to actually be hard at the beginning. I want it to get hard. Phrasing. Um, and so you, and I totally just threw myself off with the entire thought that I had on that. Um, the idea is that you want them to be, have room to improve instead of burning out really fast at the beginning. A lot of people will start a program and they're going to set their training maxes too high and I'm going to go to one or two sessions and it's too much because I haven't been able to create that adaptive response yet. And so all of a sudden now I'm hurt or I'm just tired all the time. It's better to start too easy and progressively get more in depth with this kind of a program because that's the way that it's structured to work. Um, the first week you're gonna do three work sets. Uh, the first set's like 65%, I'm gonna be wrong on the percents, I'm sure. Yeah, 65% for a set of five, 75% for a set of five, and then like 85% for a set of five plus. And this is where, um, this is Jim Windler's program. This is where Windler really kind of had something that I like about it. It's that every single time you go in for a workout, you have an opportunity to set some sort of personal record and to improve on what you've done before, but it's a rep personal record, so it's not like I'm going to tax myself out crazy going for a one rep max every time. This gives uh, people an opportunity to push for improvement and see improvement, but you don't. it's not necessarily a requirement to get through the program. So if I'm doing the first day and I'm, it says I'm supposed to do a set of five, at 85% of 90% of my training max, right? So I, I've already put that down. It's five plus. So I might get 12 reps. Like, man, I was supposed to get five, I got 12. First of all, I'm gonna feel really good about myself because I just doubled the amount of reps that I needed to do. And I have so much room to grow. It waves through that. The second week is gonna, I'm gonna increase all those percentages by five and do triples with the third set is going to be three plus, and so I'm gonna push for a maximum of whatever that range is, and maybe I'll get three, and maybe I'll get five to eight. I mean, the, the idea is that it kind of allows you to push as much as you need as long as you get that basic number, and if you start low enough, you should always hit the base number. The final week in that wave is you're gonna do a set of five at 75%, a set of three at 85%, and a set of one plus at 95%. And so I only need to do it once, but I can do as many as I can get with good form finishing that out. After you run through one three week wave of that, when they're suggested deload, um, again, I think that's kind of the idea to cover his butt because, you know, some, the people that can use this can be high level advanced lifters or lower level beginners. Um, an advanced lifter may need some time off because they pushed it really hard low level, they're still getting their beginner gains on, they're still getting their intermediate level gains on, and they can push a little bit faster than that. They may not need to deload as much. You can put you know, two cycles in a row, whatever. But for that deload, you're gonna drop everything down to about 50 or 60%, and you're gonna just do a couple of sets of five and take it easy so that you can hit hard the next week after, improve, after increasing all those weights five to 10 pounds, depending on what it was. Does that make sense? That's kind of the basic idea behind 531, and the reason I like it, um, 
to train people with is it's really easy to adjust. It's simple. I don't have to worry too much about people overtraining because it's really allows them to uh, it allows them to kind of gauge for themselves. Man, I fe I don't feel like I can do another two reps. I'm gonna rack it. I still got two more than I needed for this to be an effective thing. And this is the kind of thing that someone will run for a long time and see slow but consistent results. When you plateau on something, drop the weight a little bit more, and you start going back up again. And it's kind of that little undulating um, build, drop off, build, drop off, build, drop off. And you can see that. Uh, the cube method is a powerlifting and strongman method that came out recently, um, probably in the last two or three years. Uh, Brandon Lilly coined it. Um, that rotates uh, a speed day, a heavy day, and a rep day every week with a fourth day that he calls like your weakness assessment day, which is pretty much a bro day. Uh, you know, biceps and calves and, you know, the, it looks sexy day kind of a thing. Um, but the idea of that is you're gonna set up your programming <coughs> with a repetition focus, a speed focus, and a maximum effort focus, and you're going to rotate which of those, so they don't end up in the same week. So if I'm going to deadlift this week heavy, I'm going to squat for speed, and I'm going to do bench press repetition work. Uh, to, and so the way that he gets past the idea of overtraining any of those is I'm only pulling, I'm only deadlifting heavy once every four weeks now. I'm only squatting heavy once every four weeks, but I'm training the lifts every single week in some way, and it's the idea is it's going to kind of push me to get a little bit better, a little bit better. Um, and his ebook is available for like 40 bucks if you want to want to help with that. Uh, we're going to move into some other ones. Um, Shaco training is a Russian style template. It is very, it is moderate to low intensity, high frequency very, very high volume. Um, if you're running a Shaco template, you're lifting either three or four days a week, and you are squatting twice a week, you are deadlifting twice a week, and you're usually benching three times a week if you're gonna do this kind of uh, training program. I did this for two years, and it was some of the best progress I saw for a power lifter. It is incredibly boring, it is incredibly difficult, it is, it is incredibly effective when you have something very specific that you're training for. It would not be very effective for training someone who has a wide area of domains to train. If someone comes up like, I wanna be really good at CrossFit, stay away from the Russians because they're really boring and they don't have, like, they, it, there's just not enough variation to train all the different modalities that you're gonna need to get better at to do that. So it's very specific and it's very, I love it, but I'm a pretty boring guy too. Um, block building is something that's, I skipped RTS, which is the one I currently do. Uh, RTS means reactive training systems. It was a system coined by Mike DeShearer. It is based on a lot of combinations of other training. Um, principles of that are your basing, it's reactive to the individual. It's very individualized, and instead of using percentages, you use an RPE scale. And the RPE scale is unique to you, um, your rate of perceived exertion. And so whatever is, it's however I feel like the weight was for that day. Man, I feel really crappy today. So a weight that I'd normally do 10 times, I did it five times and that was like a max for me. I was like, on a scale of one to 10, that was like a 10, I couldn't do any more. I'm pretty burnt out. I'm gonna base the rest of my workout for that day on that top end range. And, and, and the opposite can be true as well. If I feel really good and I hit a number that I wasn't expecting to hit, I'm gonna base all my subsequent work on the high point there. And so like, man, I was, I was expecting that to be way harder. I'm gonna push a little bit more. Um, generally, you're not gonna, for an RTS template, you're not gonna plan your sets in advance. You're not gonna plan your weights in advance. You're gonna be dependent on the day. You're gonna say, all right, today, my goal is to hit three reps on squat at a nine. I have no idea what weight that's gonna be at. I'm gonna squat triples, I'm gonna get up to a range where I'm like, all right, this is like the triple range for me, I'm warmed up, I did three, eh, scale of one to 10, about a seven, felt pretty good, I still got more in me. And the next, you throw on more weight, eh, that one was about an eight, getting a little harder, but I still got like two to four reps depending on what rep range I'm in. So if it's a triple, an eight for me is like, I feel like I have a solid two reps left in me. You keep going and you're like, man, I was expecting to stop down at that weight, 
I just went past it and it felt easier. I'm going to keep going with this and then I'm going to base all the rest of the stuff I do on how well that top set went. The same thing if you feel crappy, you base all the rest of the work on how crappy it was. And that way it allows you to auto-regulate your effort so you're always training. Um, you don't need to deload with this method because you're never training past the point that your body's ready for in that day. I don't have a number that I have to hit for this day. I have a couple of goals in mind, but if I go in and what was really easy for five last week is really hard for me now, I'm not gonna go all the way up there. I'm gonna stop down here and it kind of puts the deloading in itself. And I'm a really big proponent of that. It also allows you to use um, something to determine your volume that isn't pre-planning the volume. And this is something that I might get on my little soapbox here because I've recently been utilizing it and absolutely love it. Using time to dictate your volume range. Um, a lot of guys will say, uh, okay, I want you to do this many sets of this